Today's session is uh, actually a title that I love, Anthropometry. Um, we get this a lot. It's something that I think when people start looking about ergonomics and start thinking about what kind of controls they want to put in to help minimize or prevent their MSD injuries, you know, we sometimes forget this whole anthropometric conversation. And it's really key to making sure that the control that we put in is going to be successful. So today's talk, we're going to be, it's a two-part series, so it's kind of something new for, for us on our webinar. So I hope you attend the, the second one, which will be on REACH. But this one is talking specifically on working heights and how they're going to impact potentially your design situations, how to use anthropometry um, to kind of make the, the best choices and get the best fit that you possibly can. So our agenda today is going to be quite simple. We're going to be to ask, what is anthropometrics? How are we using them to determine working heights? Kind of our sitting, standing guidelines. We are going to be focusing mostly on our standing, um, but you know, when it comes to some of the, the primary or key measurement points, they definitely apply um, to seated as well. And then kind of where do you start and who do you include in this process? So it's great that we're going to learn kind of a little bit of a, a snapshot anyways into the world of anthropometrics and ergonomic design, but how can we start to embed that into some of our policies, our procedures, and our day-to-day -day kind of just prevention controls? So what is anthropometrics? I think it's, it's a big word. It scares a lot of people off, but really quite simply, it is the study of various human body dimensions, um, body parts, different properties. So you kind of see the graph to the, to the right, and you can see that you know we have people sitting, we have people standing. So this one would be, let's say, your seated height. This would maybe be your reach. And all of these are in there for both you know, males, females, children, um, sitting, standing, grip strength. So there really are quite a vast amount of data out there when it comes to human body dimensions. It's just a matter of figuring out what information it is you're looking for so that you're not kind of wading through this huge scope of, of measurements and dimensions that are out there. And it doesn't have to be quite as overwhelming as that may seem, as long as you have some kind of base principles so that you know directly what it is you're going to want to go to. Um, and it's that's not as, as hard as it may sound, because instinctively there's a common sense just that goes with our prevention controls that says, you know, okay, I need to raise this working height because I have people bending. So we just need to know what anthropometric measurement are we trying to work for. In that case, it's likely going to be our elbow height. So just trying to get a base on anthropometric is not that scary. It's about just trying to determine are we looking for our male data, our female data, potentially our child children child database, and if we are making the right choice as far as the measurement we're choosing. Sorry. OK, so why do we want to use anthropometrics? I'm sure many of you have been doing kind of ergonomic controls or MSD prevention um, changes within your workspace to try and mitigate some of the injury costs. What we find often is that anthropometric is the piece of the puzzle that often gets left behind. Most of us don't even know that they're out there, or they may not have access to them. And if they do, they may not know how to use them properly. So there's a lot of reasons why we don't go to anthropometrics, but it really is a key, integral part of ergonomic design and getting that better fit. So what we'll see is the recommendation comes forth, so just as I said, we have people bending, we need to raise the working height. So that's what we say, raise the working height. And therefore, we have then maintenance go out and they raise the working height. And then what we'll find is that because the anthropometric component wasn't brought into the, the project or the thought process, the height's too high now. So now we have to go back after realizing, wait, now we have people with raised shoulders and we've just kind of, after hurting people's backs, now we're hurting people's shoulders. We have to then now go back and say, no, 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 not that high, now lower it. And it becomes costly. It becomes, you know, a loss of time and productivity that could be happening with, you know, 
discomfort-free kind of scenarios. And it allows us, if we're doing the infometrics right up front, to be really efficient with our controls. We can say, you know, we need this raised three inches rather than six or ten or whatever is going to happen without that kind of key definitive piece of information. So we want to try and use them basically in the design stage, whether that be a design from Blueprint, we have nothing, and we're looking at trying to design things um, more ergonomically. That's great. That's going to be your best and key, um, let's say, cost effectiveness. But there's lots of times where we put in you know, a, a change after the fact, in which case we can still use Infometrics then to make sure that you know, it's being done appropriately. So the key thing with ergonomics in general, but anthropometrics as well, is we start talking in terms of populations and what percentage of the population are you accommodating. So there's an expectation that, you know, we have to accommodate, ideally, we want to accommodate as many people in our workplace as possible for safety. And depending on who or what your equipment or controls are looking like, we're often not grabbing that 95% of the population component. We, most of our off-the-rack type um, accommodations are coming from, let's say, off-the-shelf, which basically designs to an average adult for the most part, which is kind of someone who's around 5'8". So if you are shorter than that or taller than that, then we can expect that we are really only capturing that 50th percentile or 50th 50% of our working population and that we're having elements of people that are definitely going to be uncomfortable, definitely going to be injury prone, and we may see our costs and our injury claims go up because of that. So the question is, if we're not going for the average person, what does the r metrics look like? And how can we, with one measurement, still accommodate a group larger than 50% in, uh, in the whole design scheme of things? So the advantages of making sure that we are using anthropometrics correctly, if it is being used correctly, we will definitely see, see improved comfort. There's no way that if you're getting a better fit with your workstation design or layout that we're not going to see that reduced strain, reduced muscular activity, so therefore less fatigue, and in the end kind of that overall increase in comfort and just kind of less stress throughout the course of the day. When we see that happen, when we see, you know, the kind of design element heightened in a, in, a, in a workplace, the safety culture follows with that as well. You can't put great designing on the floor and not have your employees recognize it. You know, we're, we're feeling better, we're seeing that there's an effort to be, you know, something's fitting properly, and we're not having this back and forth of, you know, let's say, you know, we wanted to raise it, but it got raised too too high and then it got lowered and now maybe it's too low and it just takes the guesswork out of things which allows us to be way more productive, way more efficient and at the end of the day we're able to kind of really streamline our, our process and really streamline how those controls are being implemented and if they're being implemented correctly the first time then there's no back and forth and no loss of time. So ergonomics goal always is going to be looking at the work, looking at the worker and trying to find fit. You cannot do this if you're making proper changes without talking about some kind of measurement if you're looking for fit. And that is exactly where your anthropometric tables are going to come in. So ideally, when we're looking at working heights, we talk in terms of elbow height. Really, everything from a, from a manual process, whether you're sitting, whether you're standing, everything kind of hinges and circles around elbow height. Elbow height's kind of our sun in this ergonomic world of ours, and everything kind of revolves around it. So when we're looking at elbow height, whether it's going to be keying at your desk, whether it's going to be an assembly workstation, we know that elbow height's going to be a key, key component in that design on whether or not someone's bending or having raised shoulders or awkward postures going on in their body. So this is an example of a standing anthropometric table. So you can see that we have, in this one it's a little bit simplified, we have the fifth percentile, which is going to be your smaller individuals. You have your 50th, which is kind of your average. And then you have your 95th percentiles, which is your taller individuals. And then 
one thing that you'll kind of notice is that we have the males, we have the females, and these are the Caesar tables, which is actually, um, to my knowledge, the largest cross-section of um, cultures and you know racial demographics that we have available to us right now. Uh, it's also it was done in 2002, so it's one of our more recent studies, and it is quite comprehensive. Sorry, comprehensive as far as the the scope of dimensions that you are looking for. Um, if anyone is interested in this document, please let us know. We can definitely uh, put you in contact. You can also Google the Caesar tables, and that will um, also put you in contact with them. There's a PDF that they have available. It's not, I will say, <laughs> unfortunately, the PDF that's free is not, it's just a PDF. It, it's obviously someone has scanned it, and it's been put in, and it's available to us, which is better than nothing. However, um, as far as kind of a more user-friendly document out there, they do sell these tables. However, they are incredibly, incredibly expensive. Um, to be honest, I'm not even sure what the exact price point is. It was a price point that I was like, nope, we're good. We have, we have the information we need. It just takes a bit of hunting and effort to find it. Um, as well, at the end of the day, our anthropometrics, although they change slightly over the years, it's not changing year to year by any gross dimension because, well, evolution takes a little longer than that. So, so yeah, so we start seeing things like stature, eye height, shoulder height, elbow height, knuckle height, and we can keep going and going and going on whatever element of design you're looking for, there is likely a measurement for it. Hand span, um, I even think it gets into the width of your face, that kind of detail. But really what it all comes down to is basic statistics. So anthropometrics are kind of looking at your parabolic curve. So you have your red components with these are your kind of your fifth percentile on the tall or small end of your, your stature spectrum or your dimension spectrum, depending on what it is you're looking for. And then we have the yellow, which is bringing in kind of, kind of our 70th, 5th percentiles. And then that green section is our, our 50th percentile work in population. So really, the green section, we're actually not bad at designing for. This is the area where if we are just kind of going, um, buying something off the shelf, going for regular design, this section is being well accommodated for. So when you're looking, your the furniture industries out there have access to this information too, obviously. But often we find that they are building to that green zone. And we start seeing less and less people being accommodated in the yellow and the red, which the, the graphic kind of shows. So here we have kind of, again, our uh, smaller individuals, our 50th, and our 95th. So just kind of keep that spectrum in mind. Now, key thing to kind of just remember, as a, it's actually a good thing, is that we have males and females tables. So how do we have, you know, pick one measurement when there's two tables we have to consider. Luckily, they overlap. So it's not quite as, as overwhelming or as, as it seems. So we have our, you know, our tall females are going to be roughly the same size as our average or smaller males. So we do see an overlap of this so that, you know, when we're hitting a dr designing for our small females, we're also get caught, uh, getting into some of our our female population as well. So we start seeing this overlap when we're using our design data. All right, so coming back to standing working heights and how or working heights in general. When looking at how are we going to design, what are we going to design, and how are we, what numbers are we going to pick, the first thing you need to look at is the type of work you're going to be doing. So the data gets skewed, there's kind of a, a coefficient or a, a factor, let's say, that we'll use to either raise or lower the working height from that elbow height dimension. Precision work, you're going to want to raise approximately four inches above your above your elbow height. And that makes sense. You're going to start seeing that you know, I'm needing more eye acuity, more visual acuity when I'm working, and I'm going to need to make sure that I can see. If I can't see, then I'm going to bend down. I'm going to start curving my body forward. I'm going to start getting that upper back flexion into play, and I'm going to start having more fatigue, more discomfort, 
and a potential claim. So when we start seeing things like, let's say, a jeweler or an electronic assembly um, kind of position, we're not going to want to go with that 41 inches, let's say, for elbow height. We're going to want to try and raise that up four inches or so to maybe get into 44 inches so that it's actually a little bit closer to someone's eye height. Now, again, I picked just one measurement, so I'm speaking to that average adult. So that 5'8 person, 41 and a half or so inches is their elbow height, and we'll talk about when to use that and when not to a little later on. So then we start looking at light or you know kind of manual work, which is generally this is slightly below or slightly at I'm sorry, um, and this is kind of our general elbow work. So our keying, our small work that we're doing, which makes sense. We're not having to have any visual acuity happening, so I'm I can see just fine with this upright position. As well, I'm not having to do any any heavy work. So now heavy work, which would require maybe downward force, we're going to want to drop that working height. So you start to see in this diagram we have the working height slightly lower. And you want to think about, you know, the analogy I always think about is sanding. You know, you could have a piece of wood and you could sand it and you could put it at elbow height and think about what muscles you're going to be recruiting to do that sanding process. All of your smaller, more you know, fine motor <laughs> muscle groups. So we may be getting get it maybe our upper back, our trapezius in there, or our deltoids and and stuff. But really, we're talking when it comes to the body, really small muscles, and we're not going to be able to generate a whole lot of force. So from a productivity standpoint, how long do we expect at elbow height standing that plank of wood is going to take? you should not be surprised if it takes a very long time because, again, we don't have the right muscle recruitment. We're not going to be able to apply the required force in order to be able to do it. And although we may have great posture, the repetition is going to be much higher because that prolonged duration is going to be happening. So we can drop that. Dropping the working height four to six inches now, although many people kind of shy away from this and think, oh no, that's bad because now we're going to have back bending, it's not low enough that it's really causing a huge moment in the, um, or, or muscle strain in the lower back, but really because you're supporting, you're pushing down on that plank of wood, it is really just using your whole torso, body weight, to help do that process. Um, as well, with the four to six inches, it allows you to use your legs, let's say if you were lifting, to kind of get under it. So you're going to be able to push up through the power and muscle recruitment in your legs. So first thing you need to do when designing or looking at change of a workstation, kind of give it a bit of a categorization. Are we looking as it, is it inspection? Is it a precision task? Is it kind of really fine motor? And am I going to want to try and make sure that we're bringing it up to the eyes? Is it just kind of general work where I can really maintain that elbow height kind of guideline? Or is there some force requirement? Whether it's a push, a pull, a downward force, or a lift, then we want to start looking at, well, maybe we need to just drop that height a little bit so that we can then bend our legs and pull up into the standing position rather than trying to lift with our, our shoulders and our arms and our biceps. So. We talked about the task. What kind of work is it? Is it heavy, light, kind of moderate? That's fine. The other pieces that you need to think about when you're using anthrometrics are going to be the equipment that the employees or yourself are going to use, um, the products that they're going to be working on, any personal protective equipment that uh, the employees may have to wear, and potentially any accommodation or um, you know accessibility issues that may come into play. So once you've determined, so we kind of have this picture off to the right, and you can see, for the most part, any individual person, now that the bike is actually on the conveyor line, any work that's actually being done is going to be relatively manual. So we can then surmise that we are going to be looking at just a straight elbow height posture. Now, when they design this line, it becomes kind of obvious that there's a couple of things maybe not designed ideally. First off, we start looking at the equipment. 
I'm not sure if it's obvious, but you can see all of those uh, torque guns that are hanging overhead. So that's one indication that that is going to be a main part of their work process. And that means they are going to be reaching considerably higher than their head height, let alone their uh, shoulder height, and uh, to be reaching that gun. So that's kind of the first thing that I see in this picture that's standing out of being really, really poorly ergonomic, poor ergonomic design there. And then we have the product. Obviously, the product wasn't being taken into consideration. We see right here um, that we have this shoulder activity happening because he's accessing the product at a much higher level than what he should. So this line, this conveyor line that these bikes are on, um, really is not set to the right height at this stage of the of the assembly process. Now, that's not to say you may not increase or decrease maybe this conveyor at some point, but uh, for this station here, everything is really, really impacting the shoulder. Um, personal protective equipment definitely doesn't come up often, thank goodness. Um, I definitely have had things where bump caps, that type of thing, have not been taken into consideration, and every time the employee goes to do a pro part of their process, they, they'll hit their head with the bump cap on. Um, so that's one. Uh, the other one was actually uh, a foot pedal. And it was a foot pedal that had a guarding on it. However, this particular company required metal, met I can't even say this word, sorry, metatarsal guards on their foot. And when we were called in, the problem was is that they were actually having to like kick their foot into the foot pedal guarding and then shake it off afterwards if you could visualize that at all. So they'd put the guarding over the foot pedal for safety reasons, yay, good move, had not considered the PPE that was required in this facility when they did that and the guarding was made too small and people were actually blowing up their knees because of the force requirement to get the, their foot in and out of this uh, foot pedal. So before we start even looking at the tables, you can see there's a little bit of thought process that has to go into designing or using anthropometrics. And we need to take into consideration light, heavy, or moderate work. What equipment or tools are we using? What the, what the size of the product or the dimensions of the product we may be manufacturing or, or handling. I mean, it could be our keyboard. If we've got a really high keyboard, then we can't just use elbow height. We're going to have to drop the working height down below that keyboard height. So there's a little bit of math involved, but not too, too much. So when we're looking at where are we going with some of our key measurements, it's not to say that you need to remember every measurement known to man. <laughs> you don't. As we said, there's kind of key ones that we want to look at. So first off, we have kind of just neutral working working height. So that elbow height, as I said, becomes kind of the, the sun to our little solar system of ergonomics. And we have it between 38 and 48 inches. So you should be aware that for a standing posture, we need at least 10 inches of height accommodation if we're looking to accommodate anybody for um, adjustability. So we're looking at now the big thing we're hearing a lot about is sit-stand workstations. And that's one of the things that we often look into when we're doing kind of product recommendations for our clients is, is it actually going to achieve, uh, you know, small person's sitting to a tall person standing? Because that is the intent of a sit-stand workstation. And unfortunately, some of the products out there just don't do that. So we spend all of this money doing what we think is the right thing, putting in a sit-stand workstation, which I know is a very hot, very potentially controversial topic right now for a lot of us. And we get it in, and it's still not solving all our problems because the anthropometrics of the piece of equipment aren't fitting our needs. So standing, we know we need at least approximately a 10-inch range of working height. Uh, again, another one of my clients was very, very excited. They had put in these inspection stations and they'd added hydraulics to make them completely height adjustable. And uh, I was in there kind of on an off thing and they said, oh, you need to come look at the inspection stations. They're really great. We've made all these changes. And um, again, inspection, so you kind of, you already kind of should be thinking, okay, so it should be slightly higher than elbow height. 
Um, and when I went over and I started playing with it, because, well, as ergonomists, that's what you do. <laughs> you play with all these things and uh, see how they work. And it, it started at 21 inches. So 21 inches is like your knee height, and uh, and it didn't. It only went up to let's say a small female's elbow height. So it really was restrictive. They put a lot of time, a lot of money, kind of into putting these in. Everyone was really excited, and at the end of the day, the employees weren't happy because it really didn't meet any of their needs. They put in 10 height. They put in the 10 inches of adjustability because they somehow got that information, but they just didn't start it at the right point. So it became completely ineffective and was a huge cost to kind of retroactively go back and try and fix it. So then we start looking at some other heights. So we've talked about your main working height, sitting or standing, elbow height is where you want to be. But we have to admit that there are other things that we do during the day. So we need to start looking at some other ranges. So in just speaking to heights alone, we're going to have our upper working height and our lower working height. Going back to one of those initial slides when we said we want to try and accommodate 95th or up to 95% of our working population, if you just pick a body part that you think is going to be the right fit, you're going to miss out on that opportunity for 95th percent, the 95th percentile or 95% of our working population. Sorry if that sounded confusing. So for instance, if you start thinking about yourself and where you're going to place things, your upper working height limit you know, usually most people will come to their own conclusion and say, you know, that's probably my shoulder height. I don't really want anything above my shoulder height. I definitely don't want it above my head. So they'll start measuring things out, and you will have one measurement that you can work with, um, and it's going to accommodate you and you alone. So just saying that you're going to say take the average upper shoulder height and uh, use that, well, we know that's going to basically give you that parabolic curve that we looked at earlier with the red, green, and yellow. And you're going to have those yellow and red people in your workplace that are not going to be overly comfortable and are going to be potentially at risk for injury because we've picked the wrong one measurement. So you need to think this through. If we need to pick one measurement, Whose do we want? If this person doesn't have to reach, will anybody else? And that's kind of how we work through things when we're trying to attribute a measurement or, or a parameter or design element to, to a change that, or a piece of equipment that we're trying to redesign. So we start looking at if the tall per tallest person has to reach, doesn't have to reach, does anybody else? So I'll say that again. If the tallest, if you're tall males, don't have to reach, does anybody else in your workforce do? And the answer is, of course they have to reach. You're going to have all your small females that are not even maybe even able to reach some of the things that our tall males are. So the answer is yes. So as you can see on the screen, I put the answer out there, um, if your small females, if your smallest people in the workforce don't have to reach, then we know, we can conclusively say, that no one should be at risk. So the only people that we may be getting into, because as a, with the anthropometrics, the number you are getting is still the average of that population. Um, it doesn't include, obviously, standard deviations and a whole bunch of statistical jargon. But so you may actually have some people that are smaller than, uh, than that actual number. But for the most part, for that trying to get 95% of your working population, within an ergonomic design, your small female shoulder height at 49.6 inches should provide you working conditions that means no one will have to work above shoulder level, which means no shoulder injuries. Okay, So the inverse of that is very similar. When we're looking at our lower working heights, who of our workers are we wanting to make sure is not having to bend or reach. So we start talking again. If your small list individuals don't have to reach, your tall males will because they're still going to have extra distance to go before they actually get to that working height. So we'll use the tall males dimensions. And the question is, do you use your knuckle or your knee? So I have two, and we'll talk about that for just a second. Your, oops, sorry, 
um, ideally, in, a, in an ideal, perfect world, we like to use knuckle height. And if you kind of imagine yourself standing, or if you are standing, because this would be a great time for you to stand and not sit at your workstation. Um, if you're standing and you have your arms up at your side, anything below your knuckle height, you are immediately going to have to start to bend down towards. So you know that anything below that knuckle height, that 36, oh, sorry, that's being cut off, 36, I think it's 0.4 inches, is going to start causing you to bend. However, if you're looking at things like uh, racking, uh, shelving, filing cabinets, all of the above, and you're trying to put these parameters into play, 36.4 inches as a lower limit and 49.6 inches as an upper limit doesn't give you a huge range of working room to work in. So kind of we know below knuckle height we are going to have bending. We know that. So we then can maybe then talk about knee. So knee, you will have bending. You are going to have that back flexion occurring, but you're not going to have it to some of the lower kind of touch your toes kind of levels that we ideally want to avoid. So we start seeing that 22.5 inches come in. Again, you can kind of rest easy a little bit. Because you've taken the tall male's knee height, there's going to be a lot, most of your female population aren't, aren't really going to be bending at that level anyways because it's going to be close to their knuckle height. So we start to see that this is where those overlapping parabolic curves really kind of make our life a little bit easier and we can get a little bit of a bit more bang for our ergonomic buck, shall we say. So we want to start just kind of looking at your, your working heights in terms of these. So we have our elbow height, 10 inch range, 38 to 48 um, standing. I think it's I had this sitting on the top of my tongue, and I think it's around like 24 to 34, I think, for sitting, but don't quote me on that. Um, and then we have our 49.6 inches. So when you start looking at um, where are your hazards maybe going to be coming up into your workplace, anything that's hitting over that 50-inch mark, you know you're going to have people in your workforce that are going to be potentially reaching overhead or reaching above shoulder anyways, activating those shoulder muscles. And again, at 36.4, anything below that, we know we're going to start having bending. So in a really short slide, you have some fantastic ergonomic data at your fingertips, really kind of key measurements that are going to just pop out at you. We start seeing that 38 to 48 elbow height, so if we're in that range, we know we're kind of, we're on the right track as far as elbow height goes. We have a red flag for upper limits. We have a red flag for lower limits. So when it starts coming into identifying hazards and making sure we're identifying the right ones, those objective measurements that you could be taking on the floor um, or in your office will start to give you really hard evidence that we need to make a change because those red flags have been waved. Okay, so I don't know what designing for is over there for. Um, we're going to have a quick pop quiz. So what I encourage you to do, if you can, just kind of um, on a piece of paper, you don't have to. You can even just do it in your head. We're gonna, I'm going to ask you four quick questions, and I want you to ask yourself, um, are you going to be using the average, that 50th percentile, whether it be female or male? We're not going to think on those terms right now. We're just wanting, to, I'm wanting you to see when do you think we use that 5'8 person as our guinea pig to design for. So here we go. Oh, that didn't work. OK, <laughs> I'm going to say it because somewhere my animation went wrong. OK, so the first one I'm going to ask is designing for clearance. Do we use the average, that 50th percentile, when we're designing for clearance? So things like doorways or um, lighting or uh, the, the cab of your car, those types of things. Are you using the average, yes or no? Okay, so if you write that down. Now, designing for the lower level work. So we just talked about this, so hopefully you remembered, everyone was listening. Um, are we using the average person when we design for low level work, yes or no? Okay, our next one is going to be our designing for upper level work. So again, yes or no, are we using the average or not? Okay. 
Okay. And lastly, designing for an assembly line. So you, you know that there's going to be lots of people working on it. You know you want elbow height, but whose do you pick? Do you use the average in this instance? So doing kind of assembly line work, or maybe even just desk height, you know, maybe like you think of a boardroom desk, that type of thing. Are we using the average there? Okay, so the first one was designing for clearance. The second one was lower level work. The third one was upper level work. And when you have to design for one work surface, for a lot of people, are you going to use the average data? Okay, so keeping in mind that anything you buy out of a catalog, unless it has height adjustability in it, that 29 inches that your desks are all placed at are generally built for that by that average adult person. We start to see it's interesting. Why isn't this working now? Oh, there we go. Okay. We start to see that not once, not one time have we picked the average, the 50th percentile measurement to use for our design work. Okay, so when we're designing for clearances, obviously we want to design for 100% of our male population as far as stature is concerned in clearance. You may want to give yourself a little bit of leeway there, but if you're looking at dropping lighting because you want to improve um, the, visual, the visual inspection of a workstation, you want to design for the clearance of your tallest males. And I wouldn't even go the 95th, I would go your 100th. Um, then we talked about our designing for low levels. We know that no, we design for our tall male's knuckle or knee height for our low level work. Our upper, le upper level work, we're designing for our small female's shoulder height. And when I said what do we pick for a, you know, an assembly line or a boardroom table or something where we're going to have lots of people around but we only have one height and we're not want, we don't have the ability to, to put in adjustability, we actually build to our tallest. We build to our tallest male's elbow height. Uh, the reason being, in most cases, we have height adjustable chairs. So our smaller individuals could raise themselves up and we could provide them with a footrest to get them at the right height. Um, vice versa, on assembly line, same similar principle. We can't chop tall people off at the knees. Unfortunately, that would be frowned upon. But we could potentially um, put a foot, re uh, sorry, a platform or something for people to stand on. As long as the work is not overly mobile and we're not creating a trip fall hazard, then we start to see that we can bring smaller individuals up to the working height we want. So we understand that this isn't necessarily ideal, and that's why ergonomists have the very pesky tendency to always recommend height adjustability. But at the end of the day, if you are needing one height that's going to accommodate 95% of your working population, these are kind of some of the, the information that you're going to be getting. Again, the key to this you haven't once picked out that 50th percentile worker, not once. So it really becomes clear that some of our design strategies are flawed and what we're putting in are sometimes not ideal because we're not able to accommodate a large group of people where there is a better, more ergonomic way to do that. So it looks like my, here we go, this is what I was trying to do, but it didn't work, so there we go. Okay, so how do we take all of this and turn it into something we could use? So where do we start? At ProErgonomics, we start back at the beginning with your vowels, your A-E-I-O-U. We're going to first, we're going to assess the job. You need to be able to determine what kind of work is it. Is it light? Is it moderate? Is it heavy? We need to know the dimensions of the either tools or equipment or product that we're actually handling or being exposed to. If we're talking about keyboard trays, that's one thing. That's one inch. We're not having too much of a, of a deviation off the anthrometrics there. But in the cases of our motorcycle assembly plant, huge, huge difference there. They did, should, should have taken into consideration the height of their motorcycle before they designed that line. So first, we assess the job for some of those informations. We want to understand what the tasks are, and we want to start dropping in where we think those hazards are. We then want to evaluate the severity of those hazards. So as I said, you may see elements of, let's say, um, shoulder flexion or reaching. 
um, for one person, but maybe that is, you know, that person is really, really tiny or really, really tall, um, and we know that that's kind of an outlier. So then we can start saying, well, what height is it? If it is above that 49.6 inches, then we know that the severity is actually quite high. It's not just this person that's going to be reaching or stretching. It's going to be every person that's going to be reaching and stretching, um, or at least every we, we can't conclusively say that we, we've protected everyone that we could. So you can use your anthrometrics to kind of give a bit of weight, a bit of severity to the hazards and the postures that you're seeing. Bending, you know that knuckle height is going to cause no bending, but we know knee height is going to be kind of our next best. So those key measurements that we put up there can be useful in determining the severity of your hazards. You can then use those to help kind of move around some of your other ergonomic guidelines that you may be using or checklists, whatever you're doing to kind of weight or rate your hazards that you have so that you don't have quite such a long laundry list. When you're getting into investigating solutions, this is really where your anthropometrics come in. Okay, This is where you really can make a difference of, even if it is in a catalog, just spending the extra five seconds and asking for the spec sheet to be sent to you so that you can make sure that that seat pan height is going to fit. Um, we spend a lot of time when we do office assessments and it's something that, you know, uh, I can't say I haven't made the mistake specifically, you know, early on in my career where the seat pan said that it was small, so I ordered a small chair thinking that that would be sufficient, not doing my due diligence, let's say, and uh, checking to make sure what those information points were, what those specific dimensions were. And it turned out that the small seat pan was still way too large for the individual that I needed and actually wasn't really much of a small seat pan at all. So that chair was bought, that chair was returned, I was brought, you know, it was a lengthy process that didn't have to be. I knew what measurement I needed. All I needed to do was cross-reference it with my solution to make sure that it was a fit. If you're going from a straight design, then you know the sky is really the limits, and you can set your parameters. You can say, we need this to be height adjustable for 10 inches, between 38 and 48 inches. We need you know, um, bin heights to be not go below 36.4 inches. We need the rack height where we hang something to not go above 49.6. And there you have it in three simple statements, a relatively ergonomic workstation that encompasses, you know, bins and racks and all of other kinds of things. So fine tune your investigations, your so, sorry, fine tune your solutions here. Use your anthrometrics to get a better investigative kind of component into your process. And then hopefully that's going to go in hand with optimizing your job tasks and minimizing your hazards and not slowing down the process. We work with a lot of companies and their ergonomics committees, and this is one of the things that I've heard back that says that's been their most um, time-saving element is when their committees have learned about anthrometrics and they've been able to give feedback or say, no, we can't have it this height because, you know, in our training that we did, um, it, this is still too high, and it's a lot easier to rub it off on a piece of paper than it is to haul a machine out off the floor and redesign it. So, and then, you know, if at the end of the day, in one hour, you still haven't quite wrapped your, your head around anthrometrics, which I don't blame you at all, um, utilize the resources at your disposal. So, you know, as the pro ergonomics team is always available to, to answer questions and help with some of the design elements that you come up, come into contact with and uh, yeah or go online access the Caesar tables do a bit of you know hunting and pecking through some of the dimensions you have there and look at see what kind of equipment or design parameters you need to meet based on some of the anthrometrics that are out there there is lots that you can utilize as far as the resources and uh, in fine-tuning some of your design quandaries shall we say uh, the next question we'll often get a lot is, who do we include? So, you know, I mentioned the Health and Safety Committee or the Ergo Committees that we will work a lot with and do a lot of training on anthropometrics with. We often leave these things to our engineers, um, and I still, to this day, in fact, uh, just last week, uh, a buddy of mine who's an engineer sent me a message, he's like, I, I, I want I need you to help me. <laughs> He's like, we put a, in a conveyor line at 67 inches. He's like, is that a problem? 
and I, you know, you have to chuckle when you hear that. When I've just told you 49.6 is the point in which you're going to have a problem, and you are now, just so you know, 67 inches is about five inches over your tall male's shoulder height, you start to see, you know, that's a huge problem. You're going to have everybody, including your tallest, tallest people, reaching to access that. So yeah, 67 and a half inches is not a good, good working height. So engineers don't have all the, the measurement information at their fingertips either. So it's nice if you kind of get a working committee going where you can bring in other people's components. So your employees are the experts and can be a huge resource for you to get some really good ideas. We always, always, always have in-depth, in-depth conversations. And then, then we have uh, managers. They've seen things maybe in other organizations, other jobs they've been, that maybe they, they have information that they can bring you in. And then, of course, as I said earlier, you always have us available to you. Um, sorry, sorry, I'm just reading one of the questions. And so um, I have here just asking, how do you suggest our team best learns how to address anthropometric issues in-house? So generally becomes definitely a conversation going back through that IA, uh, your vowel process, IEIOU, um, if you're doing your assessment part and you're able to identify poor posture, you know right then and there that you have an issue for anthrometrics. Um, so first off, identify your poor postures. Second, figure out what, it, what, what the corrective action is going to be, and then that's how we then go into determining how to address those anthropometric issues. So it's not really, um, it may sound very convoluted, but it's basically we can determine there's an anthropometric issue in-house by poor posture. As soon as we have a poor posture, it's common sense to know what needs to be fixed so that, you know, if it's too low, we need to raise it. If it's too high, we need to lower it. And then we want to try and bring in the anthropometrics. So, having this team at your disposal, whether it be an ergonomics team or your health and safety committee, ideally they should be trained. Um, you know, you've kind of got a glimpse of this, but in the training that we have done with the ergo and health and safety committees and even engineers, and we train engineers as well, um, we'll find that the anthropometrics takes a long time. We spend a long, probably at least half a day on anthropometrics, just kind of going through, getting comfortable using them. So, but definitely trying to bring about a team that has a nice, well-roundedness of some of these people. Your manager's maintenance, um, a lot of your maintenance and trades have a very good, you know, they're the ones actually making the changes, so they may have some very good input. They may not know the actual measurement numbers, but again, as I said, you can either contact an ergonomist or you can go online and um, dig out the Caesar tables or any metric tables, try and make sure that they're, I think the, um, the one prior, the human scale, were 1988. So they haven't changed too, too much from there. So even if you're using those, you're still getting in, in the ballpark as far as where you want to go from an anthropometric standpoint. So um, before we're done, as I said, I, I mentioned earlier that there's going to be an offer. So at the end of this, we'll be sending out an email. And if you are interested, we are going to be doing a draw for a free registration to the Industrial Ergonomics Conference in June. So you will have a chance to get free, free registration and uh, you just need to respond to the email that's going to go out and say, and then your name will automatically be put into the draw. Okay, uh, just so you know, for those that aren't the, uh, the fortunate person to get their name drawn, the, the conference is really um, intentions to be educational, um, a nice chance for us to kind of get together and have a great day talking about some good ergonomic key points. Um, so the cost for that, it, we've kept it really, really quite low and affordable. So it's only $79 to register for the conference. Um, that will include your lunch, uh, take home package, your courses, as I said, you'll be able to take two of the four. Um, so in the past, we have done this once before, and uh, in the past, companies will often send two people um, so that they can see all four sessions. But they are all um, taught by certified professional ergonomists, which means that you are eligible for your PD points for 
the CCPE, the CRSP or CCE um, as well, we've gone ahead and had them approved by the HRPA. So they are accredited already for the HRPA uh, points for education as well. All right, well, I hope you have a great day. If you have any questions, please feel free. We'll stay on the line for a little bit. And if you have any questions, we'll see them through the chat zone. And we'll try and answer them as we can. Um, if not, send us an email. Our info at proergonomics.ca. You can reach any of us at that through that uh, venue. And we'll have someone make sure we get a response back to you. It was uh, great speaking with you today. I want to wish you all a very happy Wednesday. And I'll talk to you soon.